I mean, I thank Chris uh, for, for inviting me. So I'm just going to tell you a bit about what I do for about you know, 15 minutes, and then I'll be, uh, I'll be answering your questions. So you, of course, you can type your questions uh, as we go along, but I'll only be answering them at the end. Uh, sorry. So this is me, this is me you know, with, with brain. Um, so my, in my day-to-day -day job, I do research and I teach at King's College London. So I teach, um, you know, you know um, master students, undergraduate students, so students studying medicine, psychology, neuroscience. Uh, and in, in my research, I try to really understand how the brain works, how and why it can go wrong sometimes, and what we can do to help. So in terms of my journey, uh, I started, so I was, you know, I went to school in France and French, uh, and I studied, when I went to university, I studied engineering, which we, we, we had a common platform, uh, every, everybody was doing the same engineering for the first two years. Then I specialized in, in computer engineering, uh, which I didn't really like uh, too much at the time. I thought it was too theoretical, I wanted to do something a lot more applied. So I switched to a biomedical engineering, which is you know, engineering to do with the medical domains and biology, uh, which I really, really enjoyed. And in this quite vast field, I chose to specialize further uh, on the brain, um, on you know, anything to do with the brain, because I think it's the most exciting organ and it's the most mysterious uh, organ of all. So I think you know, I should just try to study it more. Um, and I've been in London now for about uh, two, year, uh, two years, sorry, 20 years, 20 years. I came as a student and I'm still here. Uh, I'm European. Uh, I know in these days, especially today, after yesterday's Brexit vote, so that your teachers will now know about. Uh, just to tell you about where I'm from uh, in Europe. So my family is from Italy. So my, both my parents are from Italy. Uh, I grew up in France. Uh, I was born uh, at this point where France, Belgium, Luxembourg cross, and Germany is just about uh, you know, 20 kilometers away. So it's really uh, you know, the heart of Europe. Uh, then I studied in several places in France. And then when I was in university, uh, so I was in university in France, then I went to study for a while in Iceland, which was quite cold, as you can imagine, because I went in the winter for a couple of months. Uh, and then I came to finish my studies in, in London and I've never left. So I've been here for about 20 years now. Uh, and just to complete the picture, my wife is Russian and my children are both, you know, are French, Russian and English and they don't really know where they belong and they belong everywhere. Uh, so I'm European, I'm staying here, I'm not going anywhere, most of my colleagues are staying. So I work now at King's College London. So right now I'm based in, I'm in the uh, South London in a place called uh, Denmark Hill uh, in one of the campuses, the clinical campus of, of King's College London. So I don't know, you know where you all are, but right now I'm looking by the window. It's really, it's a really nice day in London, really sunny day. So uh, the place I work, so I work in the, you know, the university is King's College London. And there's like lots of different faculties uh, lots of different specialties in the university and the one I worked in is called the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience. So we're really you know, studying the brain in all these different aspects from all the different sides and we're really specializing you know, in mental health, that's what we do, uh, you know, trying you know, in, in, in good and bad mental health in the sense of trying to understand you know, how the brain works when everything's fine and then what's happening when something goes wrong in the brain and what we can do to help. Uh, studying various treatments and, 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 and trying to find you know, new treatments. So in my day-to-day -day job, you know, I'm a neuroscientist, so I study the brain, so that's what we you know, call each other, neuroscientist. So even if I train as an engineer, I'm a neuroscientist, and it's quite a broad term. Neuroscientist is everybody working with the brain, really. There's lots of different kinds of neuroscientists. So there's at one level, some of my colleagues are neuroscientists, but they're looking at cells, like brain cells. So I think we have a mixture of schools listening. So some of you know, will know about neurons, some of you may not know. So these are uh, uh, pictures of like brain cells. So they call the neurons, which are making up, you know, which are in your brain, which are making you think and do everything. And in this slide, we see these neurons, they're trying to connect to each other. You see, I don't know if you can see my mouse, I don't know if it shows, but they're they're trying to attach to each other. And this is what's happening all your time in your brain, right now when you're listening to me, 
when you're learning new things, you're getting loads of new connections in the brain. And when you're growing up, you're getting lots of connections, new connections in the brain. So I am not really, my job is not to look at that side of neuroscience. I'm not looking at the cells. Other of my colleagues, this is my colleague Claire, are actually working with real brains. So here you can see in the pictures, these are actually real brains from people who donated their brains for medical research. So I am not doing this either. The only brains I've got, uh, I don't know if you can see, I've got a couple here. Uh, don't worry, it's plastic. That's the only brain I've got, mine and this one, which is just a plastic brain, which I use for demonstration. So that's all I've got, plastic brain. I don't want to work with real brains. My job as a neuroscientist, I work on the bigger scale. I look at the brain at, as a system. And to do this, we use different bits of equipment. And the equipment I use the most is the one you can see here, which is an MRI scanner. So these scanners are available everywhere in all the hospitals. So you, go, you would go there, the doctors would send you there to see what's happening, not just in your brain, but you know, in the rest of your body as well. And we're using these uh, big machines to see what's happening. Uh, in the brain. So that's what I do for, for, for my research. I've, I've, been used, I've been using this for a while. And what we, what we get in a way, what, what this equipment, this MRI scanners produce, they produce uh, you know, pictures of the brain, which look a bit like this, this, what you can see on the screen here, like these Lego bricks. So we can see in, in a lot of details what's happening everywhere in, in your brain. Uh, we can see, we can study both your, your own brain structure looking at the brain anatomy and the brain function and the brain chemistry. For today, I'm not going to be talking about brain chemistry. I'm just going to show you with these MRI scanners what we can do in terms of brain anatomy and brain function. And then I'll tell you how engineers are, are, are working in this field. So in terms of brain anatomy, you know, this is just a couple of examples of what we can do with an MRI scanner. So the scanner is just a big piece of equipment, just a big piece of electronic that we program to do different things. It's a bit like your phone. We, we would run different programs, different apps on the scanner to be taking different kind of brain pictures. So hopefully you see, you see my mouse, but what we've got on the top left here uh, is the, the type of images that the doctors would be, uh, would be taking uh, to try to find out what's wrong in the patient's brain. So by taking this kind of pictures, they would look for, uh, for example, tumors or if there's any, anything wrong. And if I'm going, I'm going to stop it, um, sorry, stop it around here. You can see the eyes here. You can see the eyeballs. You can see the nose in the middle, the cartilage of the nose. And if I just go a tiny bit higher, uh, sorry, it's not easy on this one. I, like, I really like this slide because you can see the eyes really well. It looks like really weird. It looks like some sort of alien. Uh, you can see the nose here. So this is, we're looking at somebody from the top, okay? Uh, we see the brain starting there, at the bottom of the brain. I, I, I really like on the, on the side, you can see what's going on in your ears as well. You can see your cochlea, which is like, you know, uh, turning. So it's a very really nice picture. So the doctors will be using this to find if there's something wrong uh, in the brain. And for research purposes, we will be using the same images to try to see if there are any differences in anatomy, in brain size, between the different parts of the brain, between you know, healthy people and people with different, uh, you know, different conditions. On the side, the top right, this is um, uh, an angiogram. So again, using the MRI scanner in a different way, we can um, uh, see uh, you know, the blood vessels in the blood, ar blood arteries. So this is a brain which is spinning from the side. So we can see blood vessels and artery. Again, to us, it doesn't mean much, but the doctors would immediately see that then there's something wrong, for example, in this picture. I mean, I don't say there is, I don't know, but they may see that there's a bit missing, which could indicate that the, that the patient has a stroke, which is a disease which happens a lot as you get, to, you know, as you get older. And then at the bottom, these two pictures, I mean, this movie and a picture of another technique we use to map all the different connections, the main connections within the brain. So, with an MRI scanner, and this is not an exhaustive list, there's loads of other ways we can look at brain anatomy, uh, but that's the ones I used uh, in, in my research. Saying that, most of what I do and most of what my colleagues are doing here at King's College London is to study brain function. And the idea is we, you know, we, we don't want to, we want to study your brain whilst you're doing something, whilst you're thinking, you're doing some experiments, we're measuring your brain activity uh, and then using some mathematics, 
uh, we can plot you know, what's happening in your brain when you're doing some, some, some experiments. So this is an example, it's just a picture of an example of an experiment when you, so you would be lying in an MRI scanner in this big, big machine, you'd be lying down doing some experiments, you would have a joystick, you would have some button boxes or something. And in this specific case, you would have to decide if the picture on the left and the right, if it's the same object rotated or if it's a different object. And you would have to, you know, you would have to think about it. You would have, this is called a mantle rotation task. So in your head, you would have to rotate one of them to see if it matches the other. Of course, without moving your fingers, you would, you're not supposed to move your fingers. Just in your head, you would have to supposed to be rotating this. And what's interesting with these kind of experiments, for example, is we see in the brain that um, uh, you know, uh, the more rotated the figure is from the original, the more you, you have to work in your brain to, to, to find this out. And interestingly as well, the longer you take, so the longer you take to respond, the time you take to respond is linked to how much uh, the image is rotated. So actually what's happening in your brain, you are really rotating this picture mentally, and it takes longer the more you have to rotate, which is very interesting. Uh, and so whilst you're doing this experiment, so you're lying in the MRI scanner, you do this experiment, and every second we take a picture, if you want, of your brain activity. And then, as I said earlier, using mathematics, using statistics, we can produce these kind of images. Here we're looking at somebody from the back. Uh, it's, the back it's the back of the head here, which is where your visual cortex is. So this is just you know, a picture showing you, so if I go back and start again, uh, you know, what's happening, the different parts of your brain which are involved when you're looking at different things. So that's great, but what do engineers do when working in neuroimaging? I mean, neuroimaging is, is a field which is really, really multidisciplinary. So if I look at the people in my building today, there's, you know, people have done everything. We've got doctors, we've got nurses, we have psychologists, we have engineers, we have computer scientists, we have chemists. I mean, there's all these people are, are working together. But what about us, what about me as, as an engineer? What do I do, what do we do? So some of my colleagues are working on the hardware side. So they're building equipment, uh, not the scanner itself, but all the equipment which should be needed for the experiments. So the psychologists are the ones who are usually thinking about the experiments and they may have some crazy idea that would require some, some, you know, some devices. Sometimes it's some electronics we have to build. Sometimes it's some wooden equipment. I mean, depending on what they want, the uh, engineers will be building it. For them. Uh, another part uh, of our engineering work, and this is where uh, my work you know, is, and, and especially used to be, because now I'm doing a, a lot more teaching, uh, but is in the software development. So for, you know, for the scanner to work, to, to get to produce all these different types of images I was showing you before, and to analyze all the data, we need to write software. So we have big teams writing software to do this, and always in the same way that the people working on the scanner, always thinking about new ways of acquiring brain images. We on the software side all are always thinking about new ways of analyzing data. And again, you know, I think we have a range of ages listening to us now, but for the oldest ones of you, I'm sure you've heard about machine learning, artificial intelligence. So we do a lot of work uh, in this at the moment. Uh, so this is just to uh, show you a couple of pictures of some of the equipment which uh, uh, my colleagues have built. Uh, the, the MRI scanner is a big magnet, so we cannot just buy something from you know, from a shop. We cannot buy a joystick or something. Everything has to be uh, to not to contain any metal or non-magnetic metal to be more precise. So we, we tend to make everything with it. So at the top left, you see some example of just bottom boxes and joysticks. These days, uh, most of this equipment is 3D printed, which, which is quicker uh, and easier. Uh, on the right, you can see um, two, um, uh, two devices which have been built for a specific study on uh, something called osteoarthritis. Again, uh, I don't expect the children to about this, but the, you know, the teachers may. It's a, it's a disease that you may, that sometimes old people get when they're really old. Your, your joints, especially the joints in your hand, you know, when you, when you flex your, your joint, but they really, really hurt and they hurt all the time. So we're trying to understand what's happening. We're trying to understand this pain better and how we can manage the pain. So this is some devices which are used uh, in this type of experiments. At the top right, you can see something that we push, push on the joint. 
to inflict a tiny bit of pain uh, so that we can see in a controlled, you know, controlled manner, so we can see what's happening in the brain. And the one at the bottom simulates turning a key, which is something we do every day. You know, like, you know, you put a key in the door or you clench, you know, you clench the door to open the door. This is something we do every day and we just don't think about it. But if you have this disease, when you have something, you know, viscosity or arthritis, when everything hurts, every time you open the door, every time you turn the key, it's going to hurt. And, we, and the pain, interestingly, starts even before you do it, because you know it's coming. So people start feeling the pain even before they actually move. So we're trying to understand this better and to try to understand how we can help. As well. And this thing at the bottom left there is some, some sort of crazy apparatus. It's something we built from a recycling bin, as you can see, a green recycling bin. This was to do an experiment on smelling. So you, I mean, you probably can't see much here, but there's lots of different uh, like uh, bottles with tubes coming out and they've got different smells. And the idea is you would be doing the experiment. You see this, uh, you know, um, uh, this lady here, she's got a mask and she would just smell different things. And all of this would be computer controlled. So you would be doing, you know, doing the experiment and we would see what's happening in the brain when you're smelling different things. Uh, so another thing we do, so this was building the equipment, uh, and that's for more hardware side of engineering. And on the software side, all these experiments that we're doing, we have to program them. And these are some of the examples. So the one which is moving on the top left, it's, it's an experiment, like some sort of virtual reality experiment, where you are, you, you are dropped somewhere in the landscape, and you have to learn where you are, so you have to look around you. Uh, look at the landmarks, look at, oh, I'm, I'm just facing the castle now and, and there's the bus on the left or something like this. So you have to remember where you are and then you drop somewhere else and you have to go back to your original position. And we see what's happening in your brain when you're learning where you are and what's happening in your brain when you're trying to remember where you were. The one which is moving on the top right, it's, a, it's an experiment where you would have a joystick in your hand and you would just have to follow, oh sorry, everything started now. And you would have to top right, you, you have to follow so you get some instructions, move in, you know, uh, just join the dots or the letters in order, in reverse order, skip to or something like this. So it would be easy, these things would be easy for you to do, a bit, a tiny bit harder if you have to go, if you have to go backwards. But if you have any kind of mental, um, you know, mental health issues or cognition problem, it would be really hard to do. And we're trying to see what's happening in the brain when you're struggling to do this task. The one on the bottom left is a completely different type of experiment when it's something called neuromarketing. So it's, it's trying to understand what's happening in your brain when you're shopping, when you have to make decisions, in this case, about shopping. So this was filmed in a supermarket. And I don't know if you can see the video, if I can bring it back. Uh, so be fair, it's like you, you're moving in the supermarket and the cross you see moving in the middle is where you're looking at. So we're using something called an eye tracker and you can see the picture of the eye at the top to follow in, following your gaze. So we see what you're looking at and then you have to make a choice about buying different products and we see what's happening in your brain when you have to make this choice. And finally, the one at the bottom is from the research I'm doing now. Uh, which is involving video games. So you would play a video game with your brain. There's no controller, no joystick, no button, no nothing. You would play a video game directly with your brain, uh, controlling uh, this character. So that's it for my presentation. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, let, you know, of course, ask them now. Uh, but if you have any questions after that, you can ask me directly or you can go for Chris, uh, of course. So I'm going to bring uh, the chat box up. Well, so these are all my references. Uh, so I'm just bringing the chat box, which I seem to have lost. Uh, oh, here it is. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Chat. So I'm going to bring this up. Start this just for now. Okay. Vincent, yes. Can you come out to share the screen as well, so that, that your full face on the on the, uh, yeah. on the center of the screen. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so I can see the chat box now. I'm waiting for your questions. Any questions? Oh. Uh, yeah, so I'll read the, what I'll do is I'll read the name of the school and I'll read the question so that uh, in case you can't see it. So I've got a question from Flashit School. 
Uh, and as Chris was saying earlier, if you, when you ask a question, remember to set the box to everyone at the bottom. Uh, so how long does it take you to complete your projects? Uh, I mean, that's a really interesting question. It may usually take years. Uh, it, takes year, it, takes, it takes a long time to prepare the projects. Uh, and we have to prepare, first we have to get the money to run the projects, which can take a long time, let's say six months, and then we have to, write, to run the ethics, because everything we do has to go through ethics committees, which could take another couple of months. And then we have to, we have to recruit our participants, you know, do all the MRI scanning, analyze the data. So it usually takes years to run a project. But you do several projects at the same time, and you would be, of course, planning the next projects before the current one is finished. Uh, next question from P7 uh, Lilifgo Primary School. What is the most interesting? What is the most interesting thing about your job? This is from Gemma. Um, uh, well, I think what I really like about my job is it changes all the time. It's really really different. I think we we are you know I'm doing science, which is what I've always wanted to do. Uh, it's some it's really exciting. We do lots of exciting things. It changes all the time, and with you know with a lot of research and especially brain research like the more we discover the more questions we have you know so it's it's, it's a never-ending quest you know we think we understand something and actually this opens a lot more questions for another couple of studies so that's really really exciting uh, and yeah the most exciting thing for me is just changes every time I and mean, i do so many different things from like talking to you to of course like most people you know going to meetings teaching just doing research just Doing loads and loads of different things. Uh, year five, Linke House. How long does an MRI take? So that's a good question. So usually, so if you go to have an MRI because you know the doctor sends you to have an MRI scan of your leg or something like this, it would usually take about maximum half an hour, 20 minutes, half an hour, something like this. When we do research, you usually would stay in the MRI scanner for about an hour, maximum two hours. Uh, and in doing this time, if we, if we say an hour, you would do about three or four different experiments. And we would take all these really, all these anatomical images I was showing you earlier. This really, you know, these images give you a lot of good details about what your brain looks like. So we would do like three or four of these, uh, plus three or four experiments. That takes about an hour. Uh, from St. James's, how long have you been doing engineering? Uh, well, I guess, you know, forever, uh, in, in a way. Um, uh, I mean, I did study, so I've been, you know, I've been in, in, in this country now for about 20 years, and then I guess, because I came at the end of my study, so I had five years, so about 25 years, I guess, since I started studying, you know, I went to university to study, uh, you know, engineering. But of course, engineering is just so vast, you know, it involves so many different things. What I'm doing now is completely different from what I was doing five years ago, which was completely different from what I was doing five years before that. It just changes all the time. And of course, when you get older as well, your your you know your job changes you know initially i guess when i was you know 25 i was doing a lot of engineering myself now i am more leading projects leading other people to do the engineering uh your five linger house does the brain control all the body uh what inspired you to do the job so does the brain control all the body uh well i guess yes and no i mean the brain is certainly you know uh, controlling everything uh, it depends what you mean by the brain. I mean, the brain does indeed you know, control, in human, at least, the brain controls um, the whole body. But interestingly, we have some neurons. We don't just have neurons in our brain. We have some neurons in our heart, far less, of course. And we have neurons in our gut, uh, in your stomach. You have some neurons, some brain cells, if you want, uh, in your heart and in your gut. So yes, I mean, the brain probably controls most of it, but but saying that, there are certainly you know, decisions being made you know, in, your, in your heart and in, in, and in your tummy, independently of the brain, but the brain would certainly coordinate. But there's a lot of things which we are not in control of. There's a lot of automatic things that the brain is doing. So in terms of, yeah, the brain is controlling, but consciously, we, we're not controlling everything. A lot of what we do is completely automatic. Like think about you know your, your breathing and all these things. This is controlled by the brain, but you tend to have no control about it. Uh, and uh, second part of your question, your five linger house. What inspired you to do this job? Well, I've always, I guess, when I was you know your age in school, I was always really really fascinated by science. I knew I wanted to be a scientist. I didn't know what kind. I didn't know 
anything exactly. I mean, I was really interested in, in, in everything. You know, my parents were, I was subscribed since I was really little to like, you know, science magazines. I guess in the UK, the equivalent would be like, you know, for example, my kids were subscribed to like How It Works magazine, where you, know, you have a bit of everything. And so yeah, I don't work for them, so yeah, I don't make any publicity. I'm just saying I'm unsubscribed to it um, for my children. Uh, it's just when, you know, every month you have loads of science about loads of different things. And not just science, of course, you have history, you have everything. I was just interested in, in everything, but quite quickly for me, it was science. And then it was engineering, because I really like, I was good at maths and physics. And, but I wasn't the best, but I was just really good and I really enjoyed doing this in the practical elements. Uh, so then I decided to do engineering and, and why uh, medical, because I wanted to do something that made a difference uh, eventually. Uh, made a difference for the people, uh, not just working in, in, in the corner of engineering, just doing nothing, but nothing really interesting for society. I wanted to do something a bit more useful. Uh, and the brain, because the brain is the most fascinating organ. That's why I went there. Um, uh, so, oops, sorry, I have to scroll too quickly. P7, uh, Lilling, Lin, uh, by the end of this, I'll be able to pronounce the name of your school, sorry. Uh, Lin Lifko, primary. When did you realize that you were interested in the brain? So I guess I mentioned this. I was really doing my studies. I, I, I really developed an interest for, for the brain itself. And another thing, I guess, because, you know, I study on French. And in France, we all study philosophy as well. So we all have to do, a, you know, when we do our A-levels, you have to do philosophy. Uh, and you have no choice. Even if you choose to do, you know, sports studies, you always, everybody has to do philosophy. Um, and, and so we, we talked a bit about this, and in university as well, I took some modules in, you know, in, in, in brain philosophy, if you want, philosophy of the mind, as it's called. And that's why I've always had this way, this interest in trying to understand the brain and consciousness, how we think, and you know, why we think, in a way. Um, so what qualifications, St. James's, what qualification do you need? I think I, I was alluded to this earlier. We, I mean, neuroscience and brain imaging, or you know, all the places working, uh, all the people working in my building, we've, I mean, we all have a science background, that's for sure, but, but there's, there's some everything. We, you know, we have chemists, we have physicists, we have engineers, we have doctors, we have nurses, we have NHS professionals, so we have radiographers operating the scanners. Uh, of course, in the offices, we have administrators, so people who've done, you know, we have business managers, we study finance as well. I mean, if you never, to make a university work or to make even a department of a university work, you need people with all sorts of expertise. And what's interesting, of course, is that you don't have to have, for example, a business manager doesn't have to have a specific interest in the brain or in brain imaging, but it's something you developed. And everybody shares the excitement of what the work we do. Uh, what's your favorite part of my job from, again, from PC, P7? I think, again, I was, I said earlier, it's just the fact that my job is really, really varied. And something I've, I've started really enjoying in, 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 in more, and more recent years is actually I'm doing a lot more things like talking to you now, a lot more public engagement activities. I'm really, really enjoying this. Uh, so, so carrying on, St. James's, oops, sorry, I was too fast. Uh, so St. James's PS. Have you ever seen a brain in real life where, yes, I went to visit, so, you know, do you remember the beginning, there was a picture of one of my colleagues looking at brains, so we, we a place where, where I work, we have what's called a brain bank, where people have donated their brains, so these would be people, either healthy people or people with some specific dis disease who donated their brain for science afterwards. So, I mean, I went to visit, but in my day-to-day -day job, I don't look, I mean, I just look at pictures of brains rather than brains, but of course, some of my colleagues, are working with real brains, uh, you know, every day. But that's certainly not what I do. Um, so again, what is like being an engineer? As I said, it's, 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 I think it's, it's really exciting. I mean, well, regardless of, of your job, in a way, you have to try to find something that really excites you. And, and I, I love being an engineer. I love the challenges. I love the problem solving. A lot of the time, you know, this is how we start. We have a specific problem. We're trying to understand something. We don't know how to do it, and we just have to find the best way of doing it. It may not work the first time. It may not work the second or third time, but eventually you get your response. You get your answer. And usually when we get this answer, as I said earlier, it just opens even more questions. Uh, are they part of your job that you don't enjoy? That's a really good question from P7 again. Um, 
oh yes, I'm sure your teachers would, uh, would agree. Uh, meetings, just going to meetings is not really exciting. Uh, and uh, marking, you know, as much as I like teaching, uh, I don't really enjoy uh, having big piles of, uh, you know, uh, students' examinations or students' work to mark. Uh, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to computers or robots to be uh, you know, dealing with the marking uh, in the future. Not with the teaching, but with the marking. Uh, have you discovered, so Plashet School, have you discovered anything new about the brain? I guess in a way, the work we do, we always, I mean, I mean it's, it's really interesting questions because what a lot of science is, you know, you're not just doing something brand new. You build, you're always building on other people's work. So you, a lot of what we do is you, you start by replicating, you know, duplicating what other people have done, and then you just add a tiny bit. So depending on what you call by, you know, discovering something, I mean, I've developed new methods, new ways of, of analyzing the data to help other people discovering new things. But certainly some of my colleagues have discovered, some of the neurologists have discovered like new connections within the brain that nobody knew about before. And then they can even give them a name. Sadly, I haven't done this, um, but you know, through my work, I've helped them and other people discover, you know, uh, discover new new things in the brain. Or, you know, in our case, we we work trying to find new ways, new medications, new treatments uh, as well. P seven um, again. Uh, sorry, um, scroll to right. Oh, sorry, it's good to um, Can you tell us about your biggest, the most interesting project so far from CARE? Um, so, what I'm going to tell you about the current projects, I think it's really exciting. So, do you remember this uh, video I was showing you earlier about this spaceman going up and down, this video game you're playing with your brain? So, this is this technique, I, it's a technique I developed during my PhD. Um, when I became you know, a, a doctor. After my studies, I did this other studies to get the doctorate where I studied for another like five, six years. Um, and I developed this technique to analyze the data coming from the MRI scanner in real time. And we're now using this right now with this game uh, for a technique called neurofeedback when you're trying to control your brain for playing a video game. And we're using this right now as a potential treatment for ADHD, for attention deficit disorders, hyperactivity disorders. So we are, I mean, we are probably one year in a five year clinical trial, but if it works, this will be offered as a new treatment for ADHD, which is really, really exciting. So, I mean, if that's what, what I really enjoy the most is doing something that could be useful uh, for people. Um, so from the same school, what made you choose to become an engineer? I think I mentioned it before. What's the most interesting thing you've learned about the brain? Uh, I get a skill from P7. Uh, well, I guess, hmm, uh, I think we're learning over, I mean, what's really interesting is we're learning all the time. We keep discovering you. You think you've understood, I mean, not me, but the community. We think we've understood something in the brain, and then we discover something completely different. For example, look, you know, the fact that we have neurons in the heart and in, in, in the stomach. You know, when I was your age, when I was even a student, this was completely unknown. People who never dreamt about this. And now it seems so obvious when you think about it. Uh, another thing is, you know, when I was your age, or when I was again in university, people were saying, you know, you don't make new brain cells. You know, you as yourselves, you know, in schools, you're learning a lot, your brain develops really fast, but what was common at the, at the time, people are saying, well, when you reach 18, 20, after this, the only way is down. You start losing. You don't make new brain cells. Now we know this is not the case. We make brain cells all the time, even as adults. Of course, otherwise you wouldn't be able to learn anything. Again, it just makes perfect sense. But we just keep discovering you know, new things, which is really exciting. Uh, Plashet School, how do you choose people to be part of your research? That's a really interesting, uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, these days, it's all a lot of it. Well, it depends. So, for if your research involves patients, uh, you would go for special. You would go for your GPs. You would go for specialized clinics or for patient groups. For example, when we you know this uh, research we're doing right now with ADHD children, we've gone through specific forums on on Facebook uh, or through the, the different clinics, specialized clinics. 
and, and for finding, uh, otherwise finding, you know, healthy people to, to ask control. Again, this most of the time these days is done through social media or posters, you know, adverts in the local newspapers or just posters in the shops and things like this. Uh, in school, I mean, same. I, are any of your family members engineers? Uh, no, I mean, I was I was the first one in my family to go to university. Uh, which made my family really proud, as you can imagine, but not the last one after me. Uh, I was the first one, but then all the other, you know, my brother went to university as well after me. I mean, my sister was older, didn't, but my cousins got to, I've gone to university as well, I mean, some of them. Uh, so, but no, nobody, nobody else, interesting, nobody else. I mean, my brother is a sociologist, uh, but my cousin is a lawyer, uh, another one uh, is a carer. No, I think I'm the only, the only engineer for now. Uh, P7, which part of the brain is most interesting to study? Um, oh, it really depends. I don't have a preference, <laughs> to be honest. Some of my colleagues and some people may spend their whole career studying a specific part, a specific networks in the brain. For example, you know, some of my colleagues are working in uh, trying to understand pain. Uh, so they're working with those specific bits of the brain that deal with pain. Other my colleagues are working trying to understand memory and how memories are formed, uh, formed in the brain. So they would look at specific parts of the brain. But in my case, I don't, I don't have a preference. I like, I like the whole brain. Flash um, school, what inspired you to be an engineer? Um, as I think I said earlier, it's just I've always been interested in science, reading all these science magazines. You know, uh, when I was when I was a child, I remember you know. This was before the internet when I was a child. So, you know, I really was really, really look, looking forward every month to get this, this science magazine for children. And I've always wanted, I was growing up in a village in the middle of nowhere. So I was really eager to be you know, doing science, go somewhere to do, to do science in, in general. And I said, engineering is something I fell in because I was really, you know, I really enjoyed that side. I, I remember I had to choose at some point between really going to the biology way or the more, you know, techie physics way. And I just, for no specific reason at that stage, I chose the you know, physics and maths way rather than the maths and biology way. But now I'm still doing, now I'm doing both anyway. And what's important these days is to be really flexible. You know, you're learning all your life. You're not just, you know, I'm sorry to say that to you, but you're not going to stop learning when you leave school. You know, it's lifelong learning. Your teachers are always going on training. I'm always going to be on training. I'm always learning something. Uh, so it's just to be really open to everything and, and not to think that you know, nothing is too difficult. You don't have to be the best at everything. I certainly wasn't the best at school and I've, I've done really well. Uh, so you don't need to be the best. You just need to just, you know, uh, just carry on, carry on and, and try to do it. Uh, has anyone in my family taking part in, in research from Plushed School? Well, not directly. I think my children have been scanned for other research uh, projects. In general, you're not allowed to, you know, the ethics committees in your own research, you're not allowed to use your, your, your family members or, or your friends. Uh, uh, but they certainly have participated in, in, in our research as, as controls. Uh, P7, if the brain controls most of your body, what if something goes wrong and you can't move that body part? Can that happen from, from, from you? And well, yes, I mean, some of my colleagues are working on, on different aspects of this, uh, mostly in the neurology part. So, a lot of I'm on the psychiatry part, trying to understand psychiatry disorder, the schizophrenia, depression, and things like this. But some of my colleagues over the road, I mean, you can't say it, but I'm pointing to the hospital over the road, are working in neurology. They're working, for example, with people who have had strokes. Uh, uh, something that happens mostly when you, you know, really elderly, you know, uh, elderly, so maybe your grandparents or great grandparents may have had strokes. And sometimes you lose the ability because of a stroke. You get paralyzed, you can't move your arms, you can't move your legs anymore, or, or something like this. So we're trying to understand exactly what's happening in the brain and we're trying to help people recover uh, as well. Uh, has anyone inspired me in my career? Um, I mean, Close to me, I said I didn't have, you know, nobody went to university. I was certainly inspired by my granddad when I was growing up. He used to live with us in, in, in the house because he was just, uh, you know, uh, no, he was just really like reading all the time. He was all interested in, in, in everything, but he wasn't a scientist, but he certainly was the one. And he, and he, he always said that, you know, he, when he was young, he, he had the possibility, and I'm talking now a long, long time ago, uh, you know, he had the possibility of going to university 
but uh, his family was too poor and he didn't know and, and they needed him to work so he never went so you know so we, this was a great inspiration for me and my family to just put somebody you know in university which was me i was the first one to go to university so it was my really my inspiration in terms of science uh i guess but when i was growing up um i mean there's nobody in particular but i guess already you know Stephen Hawkins, who died you know, last year, was already there, present. That's, you know, this kind of, even when I was growing up in France as a child, everybody knew about these kind of big people like Stephen Hawkins, this you know, living scientist, or living at the time, sadly, uh, scientists who were just representing the pinnacle, if you want, uh, of science. So and I was really, really interested in space uh, as well. So anything to do with space was fascinating. So I was always fascinated by astronauts and things like this as well. And these days, of course, it's great because you know, like when Team Peak went to space a couple of years ago, you in schools could talk to him whilst he was in space. That's amazing. I could never even imagine this when I was a kid. Um, do you think, so again, carrying on the P7, do you think that scientists will be able to alter or control the brain and our thoughts in the future? Well, in, in a way, you are, I mean, you know, you are able to control your brain and your thoughts. Will scientists be able to do it? I mean, certainly not in the near future. I mean, it's something you see in the movies all the time. And in certain experimental conditions, we, we can do some of this in the scanner, but it's really, really, really like, you know, 20, 30 years before anything like this is, is really, really possible. But what we're doing, you know, we can, through experiments, through psychology, we can make you change your behavior, certainly. Uh, but you know, controlling it as you see in the movies, you know, to make you do things you don't want to do. Well, apart from I guess we can hypnotize you, which is something we do as well in our research. Uh, uh, but no, it's you know, it's a long way before somebody can just have a remote control and make you do things. What made you choose of, uh, from Saint Maria Goretti, and I can't see the end of the name. Um, your primary, yes, yes, of course. Uh, what made you choose brain engineering rather than other types of engineering? So I think I was saying at the beginning, I was really, you know, when I did engineering, I tried computer science and I found it, I found it really boring at the time, and this was a long time ago. Um, uh, so I wanted to do something more practical, so went back to engineering, and especially medical engineering, and, I, and brain, because I thought it was, rather than doing, working on legs or lungs or anything like this. I thought, you know, if there's one thing I want to study, the most interesting organ is the brain. So we should just, you know, I should, that's what I should dedicate my career to. Uh, St. James's, uh, if you were not a brain engineer, what would you be? That's a really good question. Um, I don't, I'm not sure, to be honest. Because, well, I mean, I worked, I worked in IT for a while, but still within the university. So I was managing all the computer systems because when I was a student, because I needed the money. So maybe I would have carried on with this. But even when I was managing the IT systems at the university, I was still I was doing a bit of research on the side. So in a way, I knew that I wanted to go at some point, uh, you know, to, to go on the research side. I never really thought about what else to do, to be honest, because I don't know if it's luck or just perseverance, but you know. I've decided what I wanted to do and I've just dedicated myself to reach this goal one way or another. There's loads of different ways. We can, for example, which is really interesting, so I went to, in France, I studied in an engineering school, which in France are really selective school. And when I tried to get in after my A-levels, I didn't get in. I was not good enough to get into this, this school I wanted to go to, which just rejected me. So I said, okay, that's fine, they don't want me now. And I found out that you could get in through another route but you know, later on, two years later, so I went to university, studied for two years to do something else, like you know, engin basic engineering, really put myself through it, and ended up being the best of my year. And then I joined the same school. So initially they rejected me because I wasn't good enough. And then they, they wanted me to come two years later. So it's just about, you know, don't just stop at rejection. If, if you can do something, you try to do something and it doesn't work, just carry on. Find other ways of doing the same thing. Uh, da, 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 da. Is it only, so uh, St. Maria Gretti Primary, is it only human brains you work on? That's a really good question. So in my case, yes, uh, but some of my colleagues here are working uh, with uh, uh, animal brains as well, mostly uh, rat and mouse brain uh, on our side. So we do experiments, the same kind of experiments we would do. Of course, they cannot move joysticks and, and, and to you know, respond and everything, but we do things like you know, we tickle their whiskers, we, we make them run, 
on, on, on little things, on, on, on little balls and things like this and see what's happening in, in, in their brain at the time. So some of my colleagues are doing this as well on, on, on this campus. But in my case, just, just humans. A lot of, because a lot of the work we do is we're trying to understand, you know, what's happening. It's called translational, uh, you know, science. You're trying to understand what's happening in the animal brain to then explain what's happening in the human brain and you go back and forth between the two. Would I recommend P7? Uh, it's easier just to say P7 now. Would you recommend this career to others? Yes, definitely. I would recommend neuroscience. Neuroscience, I saw a graph recently, uh, this week or last week, about PhDs, you know, these doctorates you do. They were looking at the different disciplines and PhDs in neuroscience are really exploding at the moment. It's because of combination of things, the technology is right, because of artificial intelligence and all these things, people are really trying, fascinated by the brain these days. Of course, uh, not the wet brain, not human brains, in my case, to create, you know, thinking computers and all of this. So it's really, really fascinating. So yes, I certainly recommend it. Uh, and in terms of qualifications, which I'm answering to Grace from P7, I mentioned qualifications earlier. You know, anything scientific allows you to work in neuroscience. That, that's great. It's, it's really, really, really multidisciplinary. We work in big teams. You know, one project is not just one person doing it. It's everybody working together. From your five Lingi school, a uh, Lingi house, sorry. Uh, what subjects do you need to be good at to get a job like yours? Well, because it's really, really, it's really vast and varied. I mean, in my case, because I ended up doing engineering and, and, and software development, so I was really, in my case, I was good at physics, maths, um, and, and some, in you know, a lesser measure, you know, biology. Uh, but again, as I said, and I certainly wasn't the best. Some of my colleagues here are chemists, so clearly in their case, it's chemistry. Some of my colleagues are doctors. Uh, so, you know, everything. You just, you just, you know, find, find, find subjects you're really good at and then have a look at the career subjects that you know, you're really good at and, and passionate about you know, in school and then talk to your career advisors to see what kind of jobs are linked to these subjects. And, and these days, of course, you can just look online as well, which is great, with supervision, which you really need little. Um, da, 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 da. How long does it take to build an MRI scanner? That's a good question. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, to be honest. Um, the scanners themselves, when, you, when we use them, we use them for about 10 years, so we get in two new scanners in my building coming, coming uh, in a couple of months. But how long they take to build? I don't know. I need to ask my physicist colleague. Um, but so it's a bit like, like your computers or your cars, you know, it's like how long does it take to build? Okay, it really, really depends because it's made up of so many different parts. Uh, but the shelf life of the scanner is about 10 years, and to bring new, there's always new models coming online. It probably takes between five and ten years to develop a completely new scanner, the next generation of scanner. But because they're always, they're always working on the next versions, so basically, like every year, there's some new things coming up. Uh, has an experiment ever gone wrong? From still from year five? Well, yes, I guess all the time. You know, I mean, depending on what you call by going wrong. So everything we do, of course, is tightly controlled by ethics committee. So we cannot just do whatever we want. When we want to do an experiment, it has to be approved by the university, especially if we're using when we you know, do experiments on people, you know, somebody else, independent, the whole committee have to approve that we can do the experiment. And if it involves patient, it has to be approved by the NHS, which is a lot more paperwork to fill in. Uh, I mean, going wrong it depends. I mean, we've had sometimes going wrong would be you get nothing. You know, it just doesn't work. You do the experiment, but you don't see any. You don't see what you expect to see. You do the experiment. You're trying to see if there's any differences in the brain between you know, healthy people and people with you know, depression, for example, and you just don't see anything because either you did your scanning wrong or your, the, the experiment you made them do was an incorrect one. I mean, this happens all the time, but it's part of science. Not everybody will succeed all the time. And, and we're learning from our mistakes. When something doesn't work, it's, it's really important to understand why it didn't work and then to learn from this so that next time, next experiment we do, we've learned from, from, from past mistakes. And what we do as well, of course, is we would publish all the experiments for other people we, we would tell the rest of the community we've tried this this didn't work uh, so you know don't do it or do it in a different way if you want to do something similar so in a way there's always things going wrong more practically we've had lots of disasters like physical disasters about equipment breaking things you know like you know 
things exploding in the scanner, not with people in, when we're testing new equipment, things like, you know, computers, you know, just like, you know, wires melting, and we, we've got this kind of, all of this sort of engineering problem, but never when, with people in the scanner. Uh, so, uh, so Maria Gretti, is there anything you don't like? I think I mentioned earlier, meetings, being in lots of meetings, and, and having meetings about preparing meetings, so it's like the most tedious things, uh, or and, and, and marking. Yeah, so you have to admit, I don't like uh, marking essays and things like this. Uh, oh, that's a precise question from you and uh, from P7. Can you survive without the front row load? Um, I mean, you would probably survive, but you wouldn't be able to do much. Um, I mean, the brain is extremely resilient. There's a lot of backup systems if you want everywhere in the brain. But the frontal lobe, which is just the, the front of your brain, well, like a bit of the brain, so the frontal lobe, you know, which is this bit, it's really the thinking part of your brain. So without a frontal lobe, you wouldn't certainly be able to do much. Uh, but sometimes, uh, for some you know, disease, like, you know, for example, of course, if you have a tumor, the surgeons would cut bits of the brain out where the tumor is. But sometimes, if, I don't know if you've heard about some people with epilepsy, which is a disease. Uh, some people with epilepsy, uh, they're, they're resisting to all possible treatments. And the only treatment possible in really, really extreme cases is to actually chop off bits of the brain. And some people have already been completely, one side of the brain's been chopped off. And they're still functioning. Of course, not as, 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 as anybody else, and it would take a long time to recover. But most of the time, people are still able to speak and still able to function after that. So the brain is extremely resilient. But yeah, if you were to cut the whole frontal lobe, I don't think you'd be doing much. Uh, so Maria, if you were not an engineer, what would you like to be? I think I mentioned it. So, okay, what would you like to be? That's a good question. It's like a different, not what I, what I would have been, but what I'd like to be. Hmm. I'm not sure, to be honest. It changes every time, you know, every time I read something, it's hard to be this, hard to be that. I mean, when I was a child, I really wanted to be initially, uh, you know, to go to be in the army or be a fight pilot and things like this. And then I realized it was what war really was about, and I didn't want to go to the army anymore. Um, so not that. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, St. James is, uh, well, that's a good question. What does MRI stand for? I didn't say that. Uh, magnetic resonance imaging. It's just the way the, the scanner, so the, the magnetic is because the scanner is actually you know, the MRI scanner. Uh, if you remember the picture of the window, you know, you lie down in the tube and the tube is a big magnet. So you're actually inside a big magnet. And the strength of this magnet is about the same strength as the magnets you've got lifting cars, you know, in junkyards. So it's like you're standing underneath one of these uh, for, for about an hour. So that's the magnetic part. The resonance is because that's how, I mean, I'm not going to explain to you how an MRI is going to work. So if you look on YouTube, you'll find lots of videos at your level explaining how our MRI works. Uh, and the imaging is because we make images from it. Uh, you have five Linger House. Do you think that the video games are good for mental health? I mean, there's a big, that's a real controversial uh, topic. Um, and I'm sure your teacher knows about this. It's like every, every, you know, every week you read somewhere in the press, what, one week it's good, one week it's bad, like, like most things. Um, I mean, we know that video games are, and I don't think it's good, but we know that if you play video games, you usually get, um, get better at like visual spatial attention. You get better at per perceiving changes in sceneries, especially when you play with these like war games and, and, and shooting games and things like this. You get better at spotting things rapidly happening in your environment. Uh, but that's not mental health, it's just your reflex become better. Does it stay for a long time after you stop playing? Probably not. In terms of mental health, I mean, it's 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 you know it's it's a bigger picture. It's just you know screen time and being on the computer all the time, uh, good for mental health. So I wouldn't think video games are specifically good for mental health, uh, but I don't think they're that bad either. It's all in the measure. You know, if you play you know one hour or a couple of hours a week, you know that's probably fine. If you if you play you know five hours every day, that's probably not going to be great. It's not just because it's not good for your mental health, it's just because you're going to be tired. You're not going to sleep well because you're in the computer all the time or you play at night and because you're not sleeping well, that's what's going to degrade your mental health. And you're going to be like hunched on the computer all the time. So you're going to have all sorts of pains 
and all of this is going to add to your stress. So it's more this than the video game uh, itself. And of course, violent video games is not something I would recommend for small children, of course. Uh, so Maria, have you ever doubted yourself in your work? Yes, every day. I think we all do all the time. Uh, even when I'm talking to you now, you always have a bit of you that thinks, you know, a little voice that says, you know, why, why are you talking to them? Why are you? You're not qualified to talk to them. And it's the same for everybody. I remember my, my head of department, uh, you know, so my, the boss of my boss kind of thing, saying that every time he goes to big conferences, international conferences to talk about the research he does and the research we do, he's got the same voice in his head saying, you know, what, what am I doing here? I shouldn't be here. And this is something called imposter syndrome. Like you ever, and it's something which is really, really common for, you know, in a lot of professions. You, you think like you're an imposter. You think like, I don't deserve to be here. And it's something which is completely normal, but everybody suffers too, you know, you know in, in, in a way. Of course, if it starts paralyzing you, it's just a bad thing. But most people feel this, and I think, and I think it's good. It keeps you on your toes. Uh, can you identify dyslexia in your scans? Uh, so again, still from some Maria. Uh, well, yes, I guess you could do a specific experiment to try to understand what's happening in the brain of, of dyslexics or dyspraxics or all the different kind of this, uh, uh, this disorders, uh, and try to understand what's happening in the brain and, and, and what's happening, for example, if you are doing some specific methods to try to, to address your dyslexia. We, we could try to find out what's happening in the brain you know, before you try this. I mean, it's not treatment, but different methods to, to cope with it. Uh, which we could try to see what's happening on, on the brain before you do it and after you do it. Is there some changes in the brain, for example? So, but yes, we, we can see uh, dyslexia in the brain. Uh, what part of the brain is the most, the least important? Uh, still from Samaria. Uh, I mean, it's really hard to know because, you know, there is no part of the, in your brain that does nothing. Everything is there for a reason. Uh, and there's different, uh, there's like your old brain, your reptilian brain, and there's all the, the frontal cortex we were talking about earlier, which is the front part of the brain, which is the newest part of the brain when we do all the thinking. If you want. But every part of the brain uh, is important, I would think, for different functions. Some, some parts of the brain are just dealing with your not. You know, you know, there are some bits down there are just dealing with breathing, for example. So if, if it's, you know, if it's, if you have a stroke there, if you have a disease there, you stop breathing, you die. Other people deal with memory, other parts deal with moving your hands. I mean, everything, I think, is important. Uh, what other engineering, so Plash at School, what other engineering projects have you taken part in? Um, well, it's mostly, in my case, it's most, if they all would be medical and all be you know, involving you know, brain or of some sort. So I've, I've really stayed uh, in, in the brain domains, uh, but I've been involved in, in a lot of things from, as I was saying, from the software development to you know, hardware, uh, to loads of, you know, we cover, because of my job. So some of my colleagues who are psychologists who are clinicians, they would specialize in one specific disease because that's what they work on. They would work with you know, cancer imaging, for example. But because of, I'm coming from the technical side, I'm working on all these different projects. I don't have one specific disease or one specific technique I'm looking at. I'm really working across the board. So I've been part in loads and loads and loads and loads of studies. And at any time, I'm part of these three or four different projects, but always involving the brain uh, in my case. And I guess slightly related, I'm involved in the separate project, completely different, not brain related, but for fun in my own private time something to do with space, space education. Uh, so we, we're running meetings for the public uh, you know, uh, in London uh, to talk about you know, space issues. Uh, so space is the excuse, and we're talking about the you know, brain of astronauts, we're talking about robotics, we're talking about loneliness, we're talking about food in space, uh, all, all of these different things. So I guess that's slightly related, and, but not related to my brain job. Uh, P7, are a lot of people working in your fields, new engineer, no, no, okay, sorry. Are there a lot of people uh, working in your field are uh, new engineers quite rare? I mean, new engineers is just a term, the brain engineer is just a term I put at the beginning. Um, so, I mean, a lot of people like in my building, uh, I guess biomedical engineers uh, specializes in the brain. No, there's quite a lot. I mean, you know, there's whole you know, degrees at King's, we have like a biomedical engineering 
example, undergraduate degrees. So we've got there hundreds of students coming every year. No, no, it's quite, it's, it's quite common, but not all of them, of course, who specialize in the brain. And some of my colleagues are not brain specific. You know, in a way, the skills we get, the engineering skills, you, I could change job tomorrow and do, you know, do heart imaging or do lung imaging. I mean, most of my skills would be transferable. Uh, of course, I think it would be a bit less interesting because I like, you know, I like to study thinking, which I couldn't do with much with art or lungs. Uh, but most of our skills, especially engineering skills, are really, really transferable. So some of my colleagues have just gone to a completely different industry. They've gone back, you know, they've left universities, going to work in industry, nothing to do with brains. They may be doing imaging, but for example, machine vision, to try to get, you know, in factories to get you know, uh, machines to detect things passing through conveyor belts and things like this. And it would be the same skills, the same, the same way of thinking that apply to something completely different. Uh, so Maria, how many of your colleagues are female brain engineers? That's a really, really good question. Uh, a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, but interestingly, uh, we, we have a lot of you know, um, female engineers, female physicists, but not much from the UK. Which is interesting. We have a lot from Italy, bizarrely, right now. Uh, but it's something that we certainly at King's, we're certainly trying to address uh, this gap in, in, in trying to get you know, more, more girls in schools to be uh, uh, really interested in engineering and not to think it's just a boys thing. It's certainly not. Uh, and what's interesting is, I'm, uh, so as part of my job, I'm running a, a master's, which is a university course in neuroimaging. And I can assure you, for the past eight years I've been doing this, every year the best students have been girls, not boys. Uh, so there's far less of them, but they tend to be the best. So please, if you're thinking about engineers, do engineering, ask, uh, I'm sure, ask, you know, this is a great scheme we're doing now talking to you, but you can have engineers come in to visit your school. And I know that a lot of my colleagues here, of course we're in London, so we can't come, but I know a lot of my female colleagues, you know, engineers or physicists always love to go to school. Uh, to try to encourage all ages to, 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 do, to study more, more science and engineering. And it's really for everybody. It's not certainly not just a boys' thing. Uh, okay, P7, you're leaving. Thank you very much. Thanks for talking to you. Christmas lunch. I understand Christmas lunch is more important. Uh, I've got my Christmas party tomorrow. Uh, but thank you very much. Uh, Plash in school. Uh, in what ways does the working of the brain affect mental health? Well, I guess it, it's, it's directly linked. Uh, I mean, some mental health issues are brain issues. You know, your brain, as we were saying, uh, your brain control everything. So a lot of mental health disorders have got, uh, you know, a physical, there's a physical cause there for the, for the brain disorder. It could be an imbalance in chemicals in the brain. It could be something, some differences in brain function or brain structure. Of course, it doesn't mean that everybody who's got this chemical imbalance will have the same or without any mental health issues, it's usually a combination of, of you know, brain function, brain anatomy, genetics, environment, stress, or, you know, or well you eat or well you sleep, all these things together may contribute to some mental health disorders. Uh, if you have five, Binge House, what was the first job you did? Well, I guess it depends. I mean, the first you know, real job was working uh, in, you know, in you know, full-time job was, you know, after my studies, was working in the IT department here, you know, managing the computing systems uh, in, in university and doing bits of research on the time. Because if you're talking about jobs like when I was, you know, in school, like, you know, summer jobs and things like this, uh, the first job I did was working with my dad on the building site uh, when I was about, you know, when I, when I was like 14, 15, just for the summer, you know. Uh, and I can tell you, this is when I decided I wanted to, to study hard at school because it was so hard. So I found it so hard. And I should say, I cannot do it, basically. I, know I need to study hard to get you know, uh, uh, a desk job rather than working on the building site. And uh, my dad did, it, did this all his life. But I just certainly, have, now after a month of this, I said, I don't want to do this. Uh, then other summer jobs, I worked in banks. Uh, again, because my sister works in a bank in Luxembourg, so I was going there. Again, this, I decided well, banking certainly wasn't for me. Um, but of course, as a teenager, I was doing really boring things in the bank, you know, I had summer jobs. Uh, but you know, this environment wasn't for me. Uh, so again, that's why I said, well, I really want to do science. 
Uh, you're fired. Okay, you're leaving. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and happy Christmas to you too. Okay. That's it. Last question. Yeah. It's run now. Is, is, is there any more questions? I, I think we only have the plushet left. Um, okay. Yeah. It's, um, Lynn Lithgow said they were going, but they're, they're still. Lynn, Lynn Lithgow, that's how you pronounce it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Scottish. <laughs> yes. Sorry. I've probably massacred their names. <laughs> no, no, I think you did very well. I was a bit, a bit worried about the, uh, the St. Maria Goretti uh, Primary School. You, you ended up just calling it Maria, so, but uh, it's still good. St. Maria. Maria, I kept saying St. Maria. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know what Maria Goretti is, I should Google it. Oh, you do? No, no I said I have to Google it to find out who Maria All right. Goretti yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Pasha, um, I think we, we're going to call it a day now, and, and okay. if anyone is from uh, Lynn Lithgow is there. Um, thank you all very much for um, participating. Um, obviously, that goes to the people who have left already. But a huge thanks to Vincent as well, because once again, thank he's done a, a marvellous um, presentation. And some great questions today, and, 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 and some wonderful answers from, from Vincent as well. Um, so, thank you. thank you all very much. And um, I'll be in touch, Vincent. Yeah. Okay, we'll, no, no, problem. no problem. Okay, bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye.